First, I would like to thank you for attending our webinar today. This webinar will take roughly 25 minutes, and after that, we will have a question and answer section. So if you have any question during the talk, you can type the question in the chat window, and we will look into that at the end. Welcome to join PIC's webinar. Please, I have talked about satellite quantification with PIC's Studio 8. Today, it is my pleasure to show you label-free quantification analysis in 8.5. In this new release, we made some improvements to label-free quantification in PIG's Q module and added a few new functions to make data analysis easier. First, the LFQ accuracy and sensitivity are further increased by improving feature detection. Selection of unique and the three most intense peptides represent protein quantity. Enabling exclusion of redundant peptides and peptides with both modified and unmodified forms. Secondly, we include one more method of calculating abundance using intensity. Before, PIGS uses peak area to calculate peptide and protein amount by default. With these improvements, PIX LFQ shows better results compared to some other LFQ data analysis tools. In addition, sample clustering and correlation analysis can be easily done and visualized in the sample. Furthermore, we add spectral counting information in identification results. So users can have a semi-quantitation of identified peptides and proteins in each sample. At the end of the talk, I will do a step-by-step -step LFQ data analysis using PIX 8.5. First, I will start with a brief overview of my spectrometry quantitative proteomics approaches. There are label-based label methods. The solid blue and red squares indicate that samples are labeled. The line shows whether samples are handled separately or combined. The SALEC, TMT, and ITREC are very popular polling-based approaches. TIX supports analysis of all these types of data. And in the previous webinar, I have mainly focused on SALEC data analysis with 8.5. Today, I'm going to talk about the label-free method. Compared to label-based approaches, the label-free quantification workflow is simpler, less time-consuming, and inexpensive. However, experimental consistencies in sample handling, secret chromatography separation, and spectrometry performance are particularly critical for accurate and precise quantification. For label-free quantification, there are two major ways to measure protein abundance. The first is spectral counting, which counts the number of MS2 spectra acquired for a given peptide, then adds up the number for all measured peptides of a protein to indicate its abundance. And second, MS1 signal intensity based, which extracts ion chromatograms and measures under the curve, or just uses the peak height to reflect re abundance. In peaks, we use the XIC method by default. In the new release, we add the maximum intensity method, which is used by MaxQuant software for label-free quantification. Now let's take a look at the uh, skill workflow in peaks studio. There are four major steps. Feature detection, in time alignment, feature matching, abundance calculation, feature ID association. I'm going to walk you through these critical steps one by one and explain what new algorithms or functions have been developed and integrated to increase LFQ accuracy and sensitivity. The first step is feature detection. Video 
generates a cluster of peaks characterized by isotope patterns and the illusion profile, which is called a feature. Accurate and sensitive feature detection can have dramatic impact on the This improved feature detection algorithm, Pix is able to resolve overlapping features, shown in this example, which is one of the major challenges for feature detection. The second step is retention time alignment, followed by feature matching. This is a prerequisite to transfer peptide identification to unsequenced or unidentified peptides, thus increasing the number of peptides that can be used for computation. The retention time of a peptide feature in different LCMS runs may vary due to a number of reasons. It uses a maximum matching algorithm to align retention time. The reference paper info is provided below. After alignment, the same peptide feature with close match to charge values and aligned retention times can be matched from different runs and form what we call a cluster. Relative abundance calculation. The relative abundance is calculated by using the peak area under the curve. And all isotopic peaks in an isotope pattern are used for abundance estimation. Their intensities in each scan are summed up to construct the XIC curve. Here are two XICs of a peptide feature. The green one is from LCMS run 1, and the pink one from run 2. The peptide abundance ratio between two runs is the ratio of the two areas. In PIX 8.5, we have introduced a salient threshold of ratio. If the reference sample or reference group has peptide or protein abundance of zero, then the ratio is defined as 64, the upper boundary. If the sample has zero also, then it will be given since the ratio will not be calculated. Lastly, peptide decisions obtained from the MS2 spectra are associated with the peptide feature. The identification is achieved through a de novo sequencing assisted search procedure in PIX. In data dependent acquisition, not all peptide ions can be selected for further identification. For example, in this project, there are four raw MS, MS data analyzed. After that feature vector form, indicating the same peptide ion found in all four samples. MS2 and identifications were obtained from two samples only, by these solid blue squares, and shown in the ID count column. In the other two samples, no MS2 was obtained. The peptide it was associated with feature vector so that the unidentified features can also be quantified. In other words, as long as the peptide is identified in one sample, it can be quantified in all samples after alignment. From here, I'm going to show you how PIX calculates peptide and protein abundance. I'll start with the peptide abundance calculation. In this example, this peptide in the peptide table, which is newly added to PIX 8.5, had two charged states as shown in the associated feature vector table. The peptide abundance in a sample is the sum of its feature vector abundances. As detailed on the right-hand side, in this project, I analyzed four samples, two disease samples, and two wild type samples. This table shows the sample abundance profile of the charge 4 peptide. 
Below is the sample abundance profile of the charge 3 peptide. The sum of charge 4 and 3 peptide area in disease 1 sample is shown as the peptide abundance in this sample. Since disease 1 and 3 samples are grouped as disease group, and WT1 and 3 samples are grouped as the VALTAP group, the feature vector group area is calculated as the average of sample area. Notice here that the area of zero is not taken into account. Then, the peptide vector is calculated from the feature vector group area. to estimate protein amount using the three most intense peptides is now Higgs first calculates a protein's supporting peptide average across all samples selects the top three unique peptides for protein abundance estimation. The summed area of these three peptides is used to represent the protein amount in that sample. And the protein group area is the sum of the peptide group area. In addition, when the sequence of a peptide is a subsequence of another peptide in the top three list, then the peptide with lower average area will not be used for protein quantification. This is because it is likely that redundant quantity information are provided from these two peptides. Lastly, post-translational modifications that occur at various levels across samples may affect protein quantity estimation. Therefore, we add an option to not use modified peptides. You can find this option on the summary page, the protein filter. When this box is checked, if both are modified and are if both are modified and modified forms of a peptide are found, they will not be used for protein quantification. There are two examples as pointed by the blue lines here. If a modified peptide is not found and there is only one modified form, then this peptide can still be used for protein quantification. However, if more than one modified forms are found, then all of them will be excluded. So far, I have introduced the most basic concepts and functions of RFQ in PIX3. Just one more point to add here. As I talked about at the very beginning, before, PIX always uses summed area under the curve of the whole isotope envelope as the abundance calculation method. Now we provide another option of using summed maximum intensity. The abundance calculation method can be configured according to user's preference, and it will be documented in the project description. By using the improved RFQ in PIX, we analyzed a published benchmark data set and compared our results to MaxQuant RFQ results. The sample was composed of a constant pool of yeast proteins spiked with different concentrations of non-human standard proteins. Three replicates were performed for each condition. For this data set, we used intensity to calculate abundance in peaks, the same as what MaxQuant RFQ used. Out of the 50 standard proteins, peaks quantified 45 and MaxQuant measured 40. Looking at the 39 common proteins, we calculated the protein abundance difference between two adjacent groups and plotted the protein ratios on the y-axis. The orange bars represent MaxQuant protein ratios, and blue represent peaks results. You can see that the median 
of standard protein group ratios from pigs are closer to the expected ratios of 3 between the two groups. Furthermore, the protein ratios from pigs are more focused around 3 than max quant. This table summarized the statistics showing that pigs gave median ratios closer to the expected value and had smaller variance. Besides better LFQ performance, they integrated more functional tools for easy data analysis. First, we add sample hierarchical clustering analysis. To turn this function on or off, you can click Preferences button under General Display Options, check or uncheck the Show Sample Clusters in Quantification Heat Map. This is the disease versus VOLTAP dataset that I used before. After applying a normal significance score threshold and protein fold change cutoff, we can easily get a small list of highly differentially expressed proteins between two groups. And the clustering tree shows two disease samples together and two control samples together. To get a complete list of all quantified proteins, you can set the significance value at 0 and fold change at 1 in the protein filter on the summary page. Furthermore, there is a sample correlation button on the summary page. By clicking this button, you can see a matrix of dot plot showing the correlation between any two samples in a project and their Pearson correlation R values. Lastly, in 8.5, we also provide spectral counting information in the protein identification results. You can see the identified protein's sequence coverage, spectral counts, and protein area in each sample in a database search, PTM, or spider result node, providing you with some semi-quantitative information. Notice that the protein or peptide area calculated here are not from aligned data. So the retention time and features are not matched across different runs, and identifications cannot be transferred to handle missing value issues. More accurate and sensitive label-free quantification is provided in the PIXQ module. Now let me open Studio 8.5 and show you how to analyze an LFQ dataset in the software. Uh, okay, so I will start with how to create a new project of an LFQ dataset. So what you will need to do is to click the first button on the toolbox row to create a new project. So now I can call this project uh, Demo LFQ. And then under the project structure, you can click the Add Data to find where your raw data are. So for example, I still use the data set that I used in my slides, which contains three disease uh, samples and three raw type samples here. So I select all of these samples and then click Open. Then you will have all of these data files in the left window. To create a new sample for each file, you need to choose the second button on this uh, column. Since trypsin enzyme was used to digest proteins into peptides in this research project, I choose trypsin here in the enzyme column. And these triptych digests were analyzed on a thermal LTQ orbitribe mass spectrometer. So the MS1 was measured in the orbitribe, and the MS2 is in the linear entrap by collision-induced dissociation. Therefore, under the instrument selection, I choose the orbi for MS1, and then trap for MS2 as the instrument method. And then I select the CID fragmentation method. 
And by selecting the sample one and copy to whole project, you can easily change the instrument enzyme and fragmentation method that you select for this one sample to all the samples that you include in the project. And then you click, click the data refinement. In this setting, usually no change is needed, and I just use the default setting. And then you go to the identification setting window. Here, since the MS1 was measured in the high-resolution arbitrage, I usually put 10 to 20 ppm as the MS1 precursor mass tolerance. And the MS2 was measured in the ion track in this data set, which doesn't give you very high resolution. So 0.5 Dalton should fit the data. And I have uh, allowed two missed cleavages on one end of the peptide for identification. To select PDMs, you can choose the set PDM button here, and then open up the PDM options window. Here we have built in over 300 PDMs that are documented in the Unimode protein modification database, and we divide them into common and common PDMs. The, the modifications introduced by labeling methods like SELEC or TMT are included in the artificial list. So here you can see a list of the SELEC labeling methods. Because these samples are reduced with the DTT and then alkylated with aldoacetamide, so for the fixed modification, we selected the carboamidomethylation on cysteine. And then methane oxidation and NQ deamidation are often seen in the sample procedure. So we added them into the variable PDMs window. And then we click OK. And under that PDM window, you can put the database that you wanted to search the data against. These samples were extracted from a mouse tissue, so I need a Unipro mouse database, which is not currently in my uh, database. So therefore, I need to first uh, define a database. To do that, I'll click the View button here, and then create a new database. From here, I can browse to where I store and save the Unimod database. Here, I will choose the Swiss Pro Mouse Canonical Database cluster file. And then copy paste this database name into the above window. And then in the FATA format database, I choose the Unipro Swiss Pro format, and then click Save. So now you have this mouse database to search your data against. Lastly, we go to the quantification setting window. Here we choose the label free. The mass error tolerance means the mass shift between different runs. Usually you can set this as twice as the mass error tolerance in the database search. Later, by checking the mass to charge shift distribution in the summary page uh, figure result, you can further narrow this tolerance. The retention time shift tolerance is the maximum, uh, is the maximum elution time shift window that is considered for the quantification of an identified peptide. So usually for a two hour gradient, I would put 0.5 minutes to one minute in this window. The RFQ requires samples grouping to generate a result node. So here you see all the samples that you select in the project. And for this data set, the three disease samples should be grouped together. So you can choose the three um, samples from one to three and then move them to group one. And then see, uh, select the other three, then create a new group for these three samples as the round type group, and give them different colors. 
There is no need to select and attach an ID result in this workflow, since the ID result from the previous identification step will be automatically used to associate with the queue result. Then you need to click the Finish button and let the program run. To save time, I will not run uh, this whole procedure during the uh, webinar. But I have the project already finished running and opened here. So I will show you the results directly. Under this project, you see we have first a de novo sequencing result, and then database search result to give peptide and protein IDs, and finally followed by LFQ result. So I double click the LFQ result. I hope that you can, okay, I need to uh, reopen the results node. Uh, this may take a while if you have a very large data set. So after I open the LFQ result node, in the protein filters, you can choose the significance method to identify proteins that have significant expression changes between groups. So click the Edit button. You will be able to see that we provide two significance methods to calculate the significant proteins. So in your data set, if you have replicates in groups, a NOVA method is highly recommended. The significance score is calculated as minus 10 times log of the significance p-value, so that the significance score of 20 equals to a NOVA p-value of 0 0.01. You can, use a, uh, you can also uh, use the benjamini hausberg adjusted p-value cutoff here, or the called the FDR setting here to filter your result. The fourth change is the maximum protein group ratios. To get the proteins significantly differentially expressed between the disease and the wild type groups, I can set the significance score at 20, which requires that the protein has a NOVA significance p-value smaller than 1%. And then I set the fourth change of 2, which means that the protein should have a group a ratio between disease and wild type samples of at least twofold change. And then I can click the apply button. So first click OK and then click the apply button to apply these filters. So now you see that I have a smaller list of proteins that pass these two thresholds. Below the heat map, we provide a volcano plot for all the proteins measured in the data set. You can see that we have the protein group ratios plotted on the x-axis and the significance score on the y-axis. And the filtered proteins shown on the heat map above are having the red or green colors in this plot as being upregulated or downregulated. So how do you know whether uh, in which group the proteins were upregulated or downregulated? So you can check the first row in the summary page. Here we choose the wild type 1 sample as the base sample. So what this means is that when you check the protein or peptide uh, abundance in your samples, the protein abundance in, in the sample wild type 1 will have a ratio at 1. And the protein abundance in the other samples will be normalized to the wild type 1 sample. And in the group profile, you will see that the wild type group will have a protein ratio of 1. And then the disease group protein abundance will be normalized to the wild type group. Therefore, in the volcano plot, this ratio means that the protein ratios in the disease group relative to the wild type group. If you wanted to have a full list of all the quantified proteins in your data set, you can change the significance score to 0 and the fault change to 1, which means that you do not apply any filters in your data set. And then click the Apply button.
Now you see the complete list of all the quantified proteins shown in the heat map. And then here it shows that it has around 1,100 proteins quantified in this data set compared to the very small list of significantly changed proteins that uh, when we applied the significance and fold change filters before. Notice that here we have the sample correlation button. By clicking this button, you will see that we have the dot plot showing the any two uh, samples correlation in your data set. You will notice that uh, the sample clustering, uh, sorry, the sample correlation between the technical replicates within a group is much higher than the samples from different groups. Lastly, I would like to show you the DB result node. Previously in my talk, I said that in the DB uh, result node, we provide you a global view of the identified semi-quantitation information. So here, if you go to the protein result in the DB search node, you will see that you can see the coverage, the protein uh, sequence coverage in each sample, followed by the protein area in each sample, and the spectral count information. And if you don't want to see this information in all of your samples, or if you just wanted to see the spectral count data, you can hide the other columns and then select or deselect all of the spectral count columns. This will automatically update your protein result table here. So this can provide you uh, a easy and direct view of the semi-quantification results that you identified uh, in your DB result node. Uh, I think that's pretty much what we have prepared for the label-free quantification webinar today. So now I'm going to check uh, if there is any question from the audience. And if you have any question, just feel free to ask directly through the phone or just type in, in the chat window.